tell the story about this rabbi who gets up in front of his synagogue and he says, my dear congregants, on Wednesday I discovered a big hole in the roof of the synagogue. And I have good news and bad news. The good news is we have all the money to repair it. The bad news is the money is in your pocket. This is an intro to the discussion this evening we're in the beginning of the Torah portion of Pekude, the last portion in the book of Exodus. Moshe Rabbeinu Moses gives a detailed account of all of the gold, silver, copper, merchandise and items which the Jewish people donated and contributed for the construction of the Mishkan, of the tabernacle. Moses shares with them and gives them a detailed account where and what the gold was used for, the silver, the copper, and all of the money, the merchandise and materials, what it was used for in the tabernacle, in the sanctuary erected by the Jewish people in the desert. We want to tonight review his account of what they did with the silver. If you would open up your curriculums, Right below the video, there is a curriculum, a PDF, which you can open up, print out, or read inside. Take a look in source number one of the curriculum. Exodus chapter 38, verse 27. It's the fifth paragraph. Vayihi ma'as kikara kesef lotzekes is adne hakodesh. Moses tells the Jews we received in donations 100 talents of silver and it was used for casting the sackets, the adonim, the sackets in which the pillars of the tabernacle stood. These sackets were cast of the silver which the Jewish people contributed. And then he continues in verse 28. Ves ha'elef u'shva meyes in addition to that, there were 1,775 shekels, silver coins that the Jewish people contributed, 1775. From this silver, he made hooks for the pillars. Not sackets in which the pillars stood, but rather hooks vavim that were placed atop the pillars on the side of the pillars the hooks were placed on the pillars in order for the curtains surrounding the tabernacle to hang they hung on the vavim on the hooks which were made from silver from these 1775 shekels that the Jews contributed seems like an innocent account and then he goes on to discuss the copper Yet the Midrash, always sensitive to nuance, observes a detail that we do not notice on the surface, but which the Midrash brings to our attention. This is in Midrash Tanchuma in Pkude, source number two, as well as source number three, Midrash Raba, Pkude. Chapter 51 in the Medrash. The Medrash says there, and this is in source number three in your curriculum, that when the work for constructing the tabernacle was completed, Moses turns to the Jews and says, come, let me give you a detailed account. And he begins giving them an account. What happened with the gold? What happened with the silver? On the fourth line of the third source. As he's sitting and making a calculation. He forgot 
what he did with the 1,775 shekels which he used to make hooks for the pillars. His chilyoshev matmiya. He began sitting and wondering. Omar, he says, Achshav Yisrael, Moitzin Yedayim Lamer, Moitzin Yedayim Now the Jewish people are going to claim Moshe took the money for himself. Ma'asa, what did he do? Heir HaKadosh Baruch Hu God illuminated his eyes. Vira Oysa Masuyim Vavim La'amodim. And he observed that the shkalim, these shekel coins were used for hooks of the pillars. And the Jews calmed down. The Midrash continues in the second paragraph, why did Moses give them this account? God says that he believes Moses. In the book of Numbers, there is the famous verse, My servant Moshe is beloved and trustworthy. So why did Moshe Rabbeinu feel that he has to give the Jews an account of what he did with their donations? If God trusts him, would the Jews not trust him? And the Medrash answers, Sheshama Moshe Litzone Yisrael Medabri Me'acharov. Moses heard that the Jewish scoffers, there are always Litzone Yisrael, there are the Jews which love scorning, ridiculing, making jokes, making fun, cutting people down. He heard that they were speaking, talking behind his back. What were they saying? Reb Chama Amar Ho'yuwemrim Chamei Kadal Debrei Da'amram. Look at the neck of Amram's son. Look how thick it is. Somebody is feeding him well. What do you expect, his friend would say, the man who controlled the money that came for the sanctuary? Would you not expect him to be wealthy? And when Moses heard this, he told the Jews, I swear to you, when the tabernacle is completed, I will give you an account. And that's why the beginning of the portion of Kudah is Here is an account of everything that went into the tabernacle. Moses fulfilled his promise. You will get a detailed account of every dollar, of every nickel, of every penny. As it were. Contributed for the purpose of constructing a sanctuary. And thus he gives them an account. But when it comes to 1,775 shekel, he's lost. He forgets until he observes and remembers that they were used for the hooks. How were his eyes illuminated? Some commentators say he saw the picture of a vav. And when he saw the picture of a vav, he remembered that they were used for the hooks, which looked like a vav. Other commentators, the Zohar, Rabbeinu B'chayi, say he heard a voice. A heavenly voice resonated within him, communicating to him the message that they were used for the hooks. In any case, for the most of the silver, he knew what, most of the silver he knew what, was, what it was used for. He had a clear recollection what the hundred kikar of silver was used for. But the 1775 silver shekels, this escaped his memory. Where does the Midrash see this story in the words? So the famous biblical commentator, the Kleyakar on Pekude, explains that the rabbis of the Midrash were perturbed by what seemed to them as grammatically flawed. The verse, verse 28 in Exodus, chapter 38, 28, in the first source reads, Ves ha'elef u'shva ha'meyes, and the thousand, and the seven hundred and seventy-five shekels. The hay in ha'elef and the hay in ha'meyes seem superfluous. In the previous verse we have, Vayihima as kikar the hundred talents, talents of silver. Fayihi ma'as kikar akasaf, hundred talents of silver were used for the sackets. We would expect the same grammar to be used in the next verse. Ve'elef u'shva meyes v'chamisha v'shiv, thousand seven hundred and seventy-five shekel were used for hooks. Yet the verse says ves ha'elef, the thousand. No one in Hebrew grammar has a hey ha'yidiya. That extra hay in the prefix which tells us that it's already a known item. It's been discussed. The thousand and the seven hundred and seventy-five shekels. 
the famous 1775 shekels. Why were they famous? Ah, so the Medrid says they were famous because there was a discussion about it. There were already many conversations about it. Everywhere there were people who were saying, hey, where's the money? We have the $1775. What did Moses use them for? Thus, the Midrash explains what happened. He forgot what he used them for. He was suspected until he remembered they were used for hooks. This also explains the first word, It doesn't just say, And 1775 shekel were used for ox. The S is the introduction. The distinguished, the 1775. Because once again, they have become famous because of his lack of recollection, what he used them for. And this also explains something else. When we read the Torah, every word has a musical note, a trop, which is read together with the word. The trop, the musical note for the word ha'elef, is unique. It's called the azla geirish. And it doesn't seem appropriate in this context. It goes like this. V'yes ha'elef. And the thousand. Why would this tune apply to this word? According to the Medrash, it's explained very well. Because these were not simple 1775 shekel. There was a big question. There was an accusation against Moshe when it came to this money. V'yesha'elef. You can hear in the music what was happening. People were walking around, and the thousand, the S-I-L, of what happened to the money? Until Moshe guaranteed them and showed them that they were used for the hooks. But now we want to understand, why did he forget? What happened to the 1,775 shekel? Moshe, can I know, had a good mind, had a good memory. You remember the whole Torah. He knew what happened to every other contribution that was given to the tabernacle by the men and the women, hundreds of thousands of people. He remembered everything. Only one aspect of the contributions he forgot. Why? What is the meaning of this? What is the significance of this? There are various explanations and tracks. Tonight we will explore one of them. If you look in source number four in your curriculum, we know that the silver that was contributed came from half shekels that every Jew contributed for the sanctuary. A half a shekel, machtsis a shekel, which was a certain silver coin with a particular weight, a half a shekel weight. How many contributions were there? This was 603,550. That's how many half shekels were given. 603,550. As Rashi explains, this was the number because there were 600,000 Jews and 3,550, 603,550, each of them gave a half a shekel. So Rashi explains, if you add up all of the money, 600,000 half a shekels equal 300,000 whole shekels. 600,000 half shekels make 300,000 whole shekels. This equals 100 kikar, 100 talents of silver. That's what Rashi says. But you still had another 3,550 Jews who contributed a half a shekel, which made up 1775 whole shekels. 
And this is where Moshe's dilemma began. So the first half shekels contributed by 600,000 Jews, which made up 300,000 whole shekels. This Moshe had an account for. They were used for the sackets, cast of the silver of these shekels, used for the pillars of the sanctuary. But the additional shekels contributed by the additional 3,550, which made up 3,550 half shekels, which made up 1775 complete shekels. This Moshe didn't know what happened with them, and this is the Medrash said, he realized that he used them for hooks. What is the significance of this? This number opens up for us the perspective to appreciate what is the symbolism behind the story. In Jewish tradition and various sources it's discussed that the Jewish nation is comprised of 600,000 generic root souls. Each of these souls has many branches and sub-branches. You can compare them to 600,000 trees, but each tree has many a branch. So these 600,000 souls are the general root souls of Kalal Yisrael of the Jewish people throughout history. Again, they branch off into many branches and sub-branches and sub-sub-branches. The word Yisrael, Israel, is an acronym, the Kabbalists say, of Yesh Shishim Ribu Isis Latayra. Yisrael is, there are 600,000 letters to the Torah. Because each Jew has one letter in the Torah. As one of the Kabbalists puts it, the Megala Mukais. Each Jew is in an intimate relationship with one letter of the Torah, like a husband and a wife, he says. The Jew is like the husband and the letter of Torah is his spouse. So we are married, as it were, in a very deep relationship with the Torah, and each Jew has his or her particular specific letter in Torah. And thus you can find every Jew in the Torah, and you can find the Torah in every Jew. When you look deep into the Torah, in every letter you'll find a Jew. And when you look deeply into the Jew, you will find the letter in Torah, because every Jew is connected to a letter in the Torah. Every Jew, in other words, is organically connected to the Torah. It's not just a superficial connection with our constitution or with our book of history. It's an intrinsic and innate and organic connection. The Jewish soul is rooted in its particular source and origin in the Torah. From each of the 600,000 souls, Moses received a half a shekel of silver used for the sackets, which essentially constituted the foundation of the sanctuary. The pillars of the sanctuary were etched into these adonim, into these sackets, representing the fact that the 600,000 souls were the foundation, they were the sackets upon which, in which, the pillars were etched so they became the foundation, actually, of the divine presence which would dwell in the Mishkan and the sanctuary. But then there were another group of souls. These are the extra souls, the additional souls. 3,550 souls. Here, Moses could not find their connection to Torah. Sometimes you have souls that seem alienated, forgotten, lost. They're not part of the picture. They're not part of the Torah, they're not part of the community, they're not part of the structure. Moses doesn't only forget what happens with the 1775 shekels. Moses had a very good memory. The forgetfulness of Moshe Rabbeinu represents a deeper forgetfulness. The 1775 shekel came from souls that were forgotten. They came from souls that were lost, from souls that were alien, that were estranged, that did not fit into the structure of Torah. And that is why the melody for this word Ha'elef is Azla Geirish. Ha'elef, Azla Geirish, Azla means to go, to leave. Geirish means to be expelled. These souls were souls upon which one can easily define them with the melody of Azla Geirish. Expel them. Let them go. Moses could not find their place within 
the royal structure of Knesset Yisrael, of the community of Israel. Moses could not find their relationship with the Torah. He looks into the Torah and he doesn't see their letter. Because there are 600,000 letters in the Torah. And here we have the additional 3,550. So initially they're forgotten. But then God illuminates his eyes and he sees that they're also part of the sanctuary. They are the vavim lamudim. They are the hooks on the pillars. The pillars were the border of the sanctuary. The pillars surrounded the sanctuary. They were the border. After these pillars, you go outside of the sanctuary. And on the pillars, there were hooks. And on these hooks, they hung the veils, the curtains, the partitions. These souls were represented by the hooks. They're outside of the pillars. They're outside of the boundary of the tabernacle. But they're still part of the tabernacle. They're on the border. They're outside of the border. It's easy to forget them. It's easy to dismiss them. But they're part of the sanctuary. What does this mean? How do we understand this? What is the significance of the hooks on the pillars? Why does Moses initially forget them and then he remembers? For this we must introduce ourselves and all of us to one of the great figures in Jewish history known as Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva, one of the great Talmudic scholars who lived in the first and second century after the Kamen Era, from the third generation of Tanoim, a man who lived 120 years like Moses, like Hillel, like Rabbi Yechonah ben Zakkai, and was executed barbarically by the Romans during the time of Yom Kippur, approximately in the year 136 after the Kamen Era, approximately 70 years after the destruction of the Second Temple. If you will look in your sources, source number 5, the Talmud Sanhedrin Dafnunam et Beis, Sanhedrin 50b. Oma loy Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Akiva said to him, Yishmael, Ochi Yishmael, my brother, Bas Ubas Ani Doirish. I expound the textual Bas Ubas. I learn new laws from the textual difference between the word daughter and the word and the daughter, Ubas. This is discussing a verse in Exodus. In Parshas Emor, Ubas Koyen Kiseicha Liznois Be'esh Tisarif. If the daughter of the Kohen commits adultery, willingly betrays her marriage, there's a death penalty of burning, Tisarif. Of course, to receive the death penalty, according to Jewish law, is extremely difficult, almost impossible. But that's a separate discussion. What type of marriage is this talking about? Is it talking about a betrothed woman? Is it talking about a married woman? Because in halacha, there is a difference between a betrothed woman and a married woman. A muurasen, a nesua, so Rabbi Akiva says, it doesn't say bas kohen, it says ubas kohen, and the daughter of a kohen. That extra vav, he tells Rabbi Yishmael, Yishmael, my brother, I expound on the extra vav. Bas is the betrothed woman, ubas is the married woman. And Tosvos explains there, Sanhedrin Dafnun Amid Beis, the Gemara is Sanhedrin Nun Aleph Amid Beis, but Tosvos Sanhedrin Nun Amid Beis, Ki Rabbi Akiva the Darish Vavin. Rabbi Akiva was the Talmudic master who would expound on an extra Vav. For him, an additional Vav, one letter meant a difference. It can be a source for a new law. Number one. Next source. Look at source number seven. Source number seven is from the Talmud in Kiddushin, Dafnun Zayin, page 57. The Talmud says, Shimon ha'am soini yoimer ha'yadoyrish kol esen shabatayra. Shimon ha'am suni used to expound every time it says es in the Torah. Kivon shehigia le'es ha'shem ha'lekecha tira pirish. Until he came to the verse in Deuteronomy, you shall fear God, he retracted. Which means like this. Often in the Torah we have the term S. For example, in that Ten Commandments, Kabed S avicha v'asimecha. Respect your father and mother. Could have said Kabed avicha v'asimecha. There was even an attempt in modern Hebrew when they were forming modern Hebrew to take out the word S from modern Hebrew. It's a superfluous word. 
Kabed Avicha, respect your father. Kabed Es Avicha, respect the your father. S is like a prefix, but an unnecessary prefix. So Shimon Hamsuni used to expound every S. Wherever it said an S, he found that there is a meaning here. It's trying to teach us some law. For example, Kabed Es Avicha, respect your father. The S teaches us, Lerabi Sachicha you have to respect your older brother. Kabed Es you have to respect your older sister. But then he was confronted with a problem. In Deuteronomy 6, Es Hashem you have to fear God. Who does this S include? Shimon Amsoni could not get himself to include a person in this commandment. Einod Mulvade, there's nobody outside of God. You have to fear God, nobody else. So Shimon Amsoni retracted. Amrulay Talmid of his students told him, Reb, call Essin Shadarasht Matei Aleyem. You dedicated so much time to expound the meaning of every S. What will happen with them? What is to happen with all of the S's which you have already interpreted? Omar Lam, he told them, Keshem Shekibalti Schar al Adrisha, Kach Kibalti al Aprisha. Just as I received reward for interpreting them, so I received reward for retracting them. And at this moment, he retracted all of his interpretations. At Shabbat Rabbi Akiva, until Rabbi Akiva came, the limit, and he taught, Es Hashem Lekech Atir, the Rabbis Talmud Chachamim. You shall fear God. The S teaches us to include Torah scholars, students of Torah. Let's understand what happens here. The Tana Shimonam Sony creates a novel idea. Wherever it says S in the whole Torah, it's coming to teach us an additional law. And then he gets stuck. He works it out in the whole Bible, but then he gets stuck in one place. We're in Deuteronomy, Es Hashem how can you add another entity in addition to God from whom to fear? And therefore, Shimon Amasoni says, I received reward for my work and now I'm going to retract. It's all over. I take back what I said. It does not work out. Comes Rabbi Akiva and he discovers the meaning of the yes. Es Hashem the Torah is saying, don't only fear God. You ought to experience all also to the student of Torah, to the Talmud HaChamim. And here, by the way, we see an interesting idea. We observe a very powerful idea. Shimon Amsoni figured out every yes in the whole Torah. Not an easy task. Why could he not figure out what Rabbi Akiva figured out? Why could he himself not come to the conclusion that as Hashem Alekech Atira means, you should fear a Talmud Chacham? Couldn't he himself understand what Rabbi Akiva understood? There are different answers given. There's one interesting answer that was once given by Rabbi Cook, Rabbi Avraham Yitzchak Cohen Cook, the first chief rabbi of Israel, who wrote that Shimon Ham Sony lived in the times of the first Christians who were Jewish. And to expound a verse and explain that the ought to God ought to extend also to students of Torah, to Talmud Chachamim, he felt was too dangerous. Rabbi Akiva, however, lived post the destruction of the temple when Christianity has been completely segregated from Judaism and now it was no problem to rediscover the truth that yes, we experience awe from the Talmud Chacham, from the person who dedicates his life to Torah. To Torah learning, to Torah ethics, to Torah spirituality and to embody the values and the morals of Torah. There is yet a deeper answer, not just historical, but uh, spiritual. That has been given to this. And it's really connected also to the first answer. Rabbi Akiva derived this law from the behavior of Shimon Hamsoni. I'm going to ask you to imagine the following scenario. A professor of physics discovered major breakthroughs in the world of physics. And he knows that if he comes out with this breakthrough to the world, it can revolutionize our understanding of physics. The problem is, one equation does not work out. One little equation is inconsistent with years and years of scientific, scru- scientific scrutiny. 
What will that professor do? What would you do? Would he stand up and say, 20 years down the drain, 40 years down the drain, it's all wrong, it didn't work out in this detail, it disproves my theory? Or maybe will he ignore that detail? After all, there are prospects of tremendous fame, maybe even a Nobel Prize. Headlines that will uh, take him and his work to a whole new level. Never mind the money and the praise and the attention and the celebrity status for all of eternity. It's clear that sometimes, at least, some individuals would surrender to this psychological temptation and ignore that small little detail that may be inaccurate. Come back to Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva watches Shimonam Sunni who dedicated years upon years. His life mission was to discover the secret of the S in the whole Torah, and he does it successfully. And then one verse, one verse he could not figure out, one S. Shimon Hamsoni does not grasp. And what does he say? He says, "Kishem she kibalti schara la drisha, kach kibalti schara la prisha." I studied for the sake of truth, and I will retract for the sake of truth. It's fine. It's all over. He throws out his theory when Rabbi Akiva sees what a human being is capable of becoming. When Rabbi Akiva sees. What a human being is capable of making of himself, transcending his ego for the sake of truth. Now Rabbi Akiva says, You should not only fear God, you should fear a Talmud Chacham. It's not just Rabbi Akiva discovered the S, which Shimon Amsoyni did not discover. From Shimon Amsoyni's retraction, Rabbi Akiva discovered what is the potential of a human being. A human being can transcend his ego so profoundly to the point that he nullifies himself to the truth. Now Rabbi Akiva says, Ah, es Hashem tira, is chachamim. To include a Talmud Chachem, not because he's great, but because he surrenders himself completely to truth, to God. So Rabbi Akiva was the one who completed the last S, the missing link. What was the connection to Rabbi Akiva? Why is it Rabbi Akiva who discovers the meaning of every Vav and every S? The Vav is the prefix, Ubas, and the S again is like a prefix. To understand this, let us discover and study another story. Source 8 in your curriculum. From Talmud Menachas, page 29b, Dav Chavtes Amit Beis. Omar Rabbi Yehuda, Omar Rav, Rabbi Yehuda said in the name of Rav. B'Shah Sha'ala Moshe La'amare Motzei La'Kadosh Baruch Hu Sh'yoshe V'Koshik Sorim Lo'Isyes. When Moses went up to heaven after the Torah was given, he found that God was sitting and drawing crowns on the letters of the Torah. What are these crowns? So we have here in the curriculum a picture for you. If you'll go to the second to the last page of the curriculum, you'll see a whole page. On top of it, it says Tagim. These are the crowns on the letters of the Torah. There are seven letters in the Torah. That upon, upon top of these letters, there are three little lines, three little ksorim. They're called tagim, koitzim, crowns, seven letters. Shatnes gets, shin, ayin, tes, nun, zayin, gimel, and tzaddik. So on the last page of your curriculum, you have the page of a Torah scroll where you have these lines on seven letters. It's actually from the portion of Pkude here. Take, for example, the nun on the first line. You see there are three lines on top of the nun. Moses sees God drawing these lines. So Moshe tells him, Master of the universe, who are these for? Who's compelling you to write these crowns? What's the point? They're mystical. They're completely mystical. Omar Loi, God told them, Adam Echad Yesha Asid Lias Besef Kamadurez Vakiva Ben Yosef Shmoy. 
After many generations there will be born a man, his name will be Akiva, the son of Yosef. On each of these crowns, on each of these thorns, he will expound heaps and heaps of laws. So Moses tells him, God Almighty, you have such a person and you're giving the Torah through me? Give it to him. Give it through him. And Hashem tells him, Shsaik, kachala b'machshav. Be quiet. This ascended in my thought. And as you have here, Moses asks Hashem to see him, and he lets him observe him, and he sits in the yeshiva at the end of the eighth row, according to another version, the eighteenth row, and he listens to Rabbi Akiva's lecture. What is the meaning of the story? Moshe comes up to heaven, Hashem is preparing the Torah scroll, and on top of some letters he's drawing crowns, and Moshe says, who are these four? Who needs them? Who's forcing you to make such a Torah? And he says, there's one man, Akiva ben Yosef. He will expound on each of these crowns heaps of laws. And Moshe feels humble. Why then is the Torah being given through me? What is the meaning of this episode? And one of the explanations explained in works of Kabbalah and Hasidic of Jewish spirituality is, each Jew has a letter in the Torah, as we discussed earlier, Yesh, shishim ribo yaisis l'toyre is Yisrael. Every Jew is organically connected to the Torah. But sometimes you look at a Jew and you look at the Torah and you don't see the relationship, you don't see the connection. Sometimes you look at a Jew and you do not find his or her letter in the Torah. Does this mean that the Jew does not have a connection to the Torah? No. Sometimes this Jew is rooted not in the letters, but in the crowns above the letters. Those crowns which are very small, those crowns which have no clear, rational explanation and meaning like the letters and words themselves. These crowns which transcend the letters. Sometimes the Jewish soul is rooted in these crowns above the letters. Moshe Rabbeinu Moses, based on who he is, based on his experience, based on his background, he grasps the full meaning and the untold layers of meaning in every letter of Torah. Rabbi Akiva, however, Rabbi Akiva grasps not only the letters, Rabbi Akiva grasps also that which transcends the letters, that mystical, supernatural energy which transcends the letters. Rabbi Akiva, as we know, comes from a very different background. Rabbi Akiva was the son of converts. Rabbi Akiva's parents converted to Judaism. Rabbi Akiva is a descendant of Sisra, Sisra is that famous biblical figure, the, can- the general of Canaan who oppressed and declared war against the Jewish people. The Talmud tells us in Sanhedrin, Sadiq Vav, Sanhedrin 96, Mibnei Bonov shall Sisra lamdu Torah. The grandchildren of Sisra were learning Torah. And one of the virgins in the Gduke Seferim in Gemara reads, Who is it, Rabbi Akiva? That Rizal tells us in Shara Gilgulim. The 38th introduction there, Rabbi Akiva was a descendant of Sisra. So Rabbi Akiva comes from a very different background than Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe comes from the tribe of Levi. Rabbi Akiva is a descendant of none other than Sisra. Now take Rabbi Akiva's life himself. And if you go to the fascinating ninth source, Mesech the Psachim, Daf Mem Tesam Psachim 49b, listen to Rabbi Akiva's words. Amar Rabbi Akiva, Kishahayisi Amaaretz Amarti Mi Yitenli Talmud Chachem Ven Ashcheno Kechamar. When I was in Amaaretz in my young years, when I was absolutely ignorant and totally divorced from Torah, I used to say, Who will give me a Torah scholar and I will bite him like a donkey? Amrulay Talmud of his students told him, Rebbe, Emar Kekele, Rebbe, say like a dog. No, the former bites and breaks the bones. The latter bites but does not break the bones. Can you understand? They're telling him, Rebbe, bite like a dog. He says, no, like a donkey. Because I used to say, show me a Talmud Chachem, show me a Torah scholar, and I will bite him like a donkey, breaking the bones of the person. What is going on here? What is the meaning of this? The same Rebbe Akiva, 
the same exact Rabbi Akiva, who years later will tell us, as Hashem Alekechatira, the Rabbis Talmidei Chachamim, that the fear to God ought to extend also to the Talmud Chachem, the same Rabbi Akiva, who says that one ought to experience reverence and awe from the Talmud Chachem, from the student of Torah, this Rabbi Akiva in his youth used to say, I'll bite this person like a donkey. I'll maul him like a donkey. Until the age of 40, we know, our sages say Rabbi Akiva did not study a word of Torah. And yet this same human being went through a transformation. He became the greatest Torah giant to the Jewish people. And during the most fateful moments in our history after the destruction of the Second Temple when we lost our state and our commonwealth and our temple and our political sovereignty and our structure. And it seemed like the Jewish people would be decimated completely, not just physically but spiritually. And Rabbi Akiva was the person who stood up and saved Torah. The Talmud tells us in Tractate Sanhedrin 86, Pevava Med Aleph, Stam Asnisin Reb Meir, Stam Taisefter Reb Nechemia, Stam Sifra Reb Yehuda, Stam Sifri Reb Shimon, V'kulu Alibad Rabbi Akiva. We have the Mishnah authored by Reb Meir, we have the Brisa by Reb Nechemia, we have Sifra by Reb Yehuda, Sifri Reb Shimon, these are the great pillars of the oral literature, the Torah Shabbal Peh, the oral tradition of Jewish law and Jewish ideas, but all of these books are all Aliba de Rabbi Akiva, they all can be traced back to the perspective, to the Veltan Shaun, to the teachings of Rabbi Akiva. So Rabbi Akiva embodies a transformation from one extreme to the opposite extreme. From the person who says, when I was an Amoritz, I would bite the Talmud Chachem like a donkey, to the greatest Torah giant in his time and perhaps in all of history, or one of the greatest Torah giants in all of history, to the person who Moses says, why are you giving the Torah through me? Give it through him. Two extremes in the life of Rabbi Akiva. Now it's interesting. Tosvos in Ksuvis, Dav Samach Beis, Tosvos in Ksuvis 62b asks a question. The Talmud says there that Rabbi Akiva's wife, whose name was Rachel. She was the daughter of a very wealthy man whose name was Kalba Savu, and she liked Rabbi Akiva. He was a simple shepherd, an ignoramus, but she liked him because he was Sunia O'Malley. He was a very modest and fine human being. And she asked him to marry, and there's a whole story how they got married and what happened after the marriage. Her father got upset, and he excommunicated his daughter and his son-in-law, and Taisva says, how can you say that she saw that he was modest and fine when the Akiva testifies about himself that when he was in Amoritz, he said, give me a Talmud Chachem and I'll maul him like a donkey. That's not a very fine way of communicating. It doesn't represent a developed or fine character. And Taisva says, Taisva answers, it's not because he hated Talmud Chacham. Rather, he felt that they were arrogant. They were pompous. They boasted themselves over the ignorant Jews. And that the scholars hated the simple ignorant Jews. And because of that, he said what he said. Let's understand this. Fine. He despised their arrogance or the, his, their perceived arrogance. Why he more than everybody else? Why did he experience this rage, this ire, towards the Talmidei Chachamim more than anybody else? It's obvious. The answer is quite obvious. The spiritual potential and yearning of Rabbi Akiva was so profound that when it was being obstructed, it generated tremendous feelings of hatred. The greater your potential, the greater your dream, the greater your hidden ambitions the greater the negative energy and animosity that will be created if your dream cannot be realized. Somebody who's destined to live a more ordinary life, or as Thoreau said, most people live lives of quiet desperation, new. But if you have the potential to become a great human being, and yet that potential is denied, it's obstructed for whatever reason, the burst 
the tension that's created is so much more powerful. Rabbi Akiva, deep in his heart, felt his greatness. He felt the potential of his momentous contribution to the world. Rabbi Akiva's heart was the one which would be able to contain the most traumatic moments in Jewish history till the Holocaust, till Auschwitz. Rabbi Akiva was the one who can orchestrate and navigate the Torah Shabal Peh, the oral tradition, so that it navigates, so that it directs the Jewish people in a millennia-long journey through exile. And all of this could have been destroyed because of the fact that nobody gave him the ability to enter into the kingdom of Jewish thought, to enter into the royalty of Jewish ideas, to enter into the palace of Torah. And that's why there was such a hatred. Let me bite him like a mole because the potential that's being destroyed. So Rabbi Akiva, more than anybody else, understood very well what happens when you do not give somebody hope when you do not see his letter in Torah? What happens when you forget a Jew? When you alienate a soul? When you tell one child or one student, you're disconnected, you don't have a letter in Torah. You're not part of Torah. Rabbi Akiva, more than anybody else, knew and understood and appreciated that every single Jew has a relationship to Torah, even the Jew who doesn't have a letter in the Torah. Rabbi Akiva says, look into the tag, look into the crown, look above the letter. You may not see it vividly in the letter. You have to study it deeper. You have to go into the mystical layers of the letter and to the mystical layers of the soul, and you will find the relationship between this Jew and Torah. Go back to that Talmud in Menachah, source 8. What did God say? On every crown, Rabbi Akiva will expound heaps and heaps of laws. Kites in Hebrew literally means a thorn. The reason is because those crowns on the letters look like thorns. On a deeper level, what God was telling Moshe is this. You know what makes Rabbi Akiva so special? Al kol kites v'kites. On each thorn, he finds mounds and heaps of law. Sometimes you look at a human being and he or she looks like a kites. They look like a thorn. A thorn pricks you. A thorn stings you. Contact with a thorn is never very geschmack. It's never very delightful. Rabbi Akiva's power is, I'll call kites with kites. Sometimes you look at a Jew and the Jew may look like a thorn. Not only is he alienated, not only is she estranged, not only are they detached, but sometimes they even have a edge, an attitude that's negative. And yet Rabbi Akiva says, look deeper and you'll see that from them and on them you can expound and discover heaps and heaps of halacha, of Torah, of Judaism, of godliness. And this is the meaning of a very powerful statement of our sages. And you have it in source number 10 in your curriculums. The verse says in Job chapter 28, verse 10, God penetrates the rocks for waters to flow out and all of the glory of God, His eyes beheld. So the Midrash says, All of God's glory is eyes witnessed. This refers to Rabbi Akiva. Revelations withheld from Moses at Sinai were revealed to Rabbi Akiva and his colleagues. Rabbi Akiva saw things that his colleagues did not see. This powerful statement of our sages sheds light on who Rabbi Akiva was. Rabbi Akiva, the son of converts, and according to some, himself a convert. Rabbi Akiva, a descendant of Sisra, the arch enemy of the Jewish people, saw things that Moses did not see at Sinai. What's the connection with this verse in Job? God penetrates the rocks for the waters to come out, and all of the glory he beheld. According to the above, we understand the connection very well. Sometimes you look at a human being and you see a rock. Sometimes you look at a heart and you see a stone. It can't be penetrated, it can't be touched, it can't be moved. Rabbi Akiva was the one who understood that within the rock, 
you can split the rock and you'll discover your oirim, you'll discover rivers of water. How did Rabbi Akiva discover this? He knew it from himself. The Medrash tells us in Avaz de Reb Nassim that at the age of 40, Rabbi Akiva once observed a cleft in a rock and he discovered that this was done from drops of water. Decades and decades, the water, the drops of water flowed slowly until they made a dent in the rock. And Rabbi Akiva said, if droplets of water can penetrate a rock, certainly Torah can penetrate my mind, can penetrate my heart. And Rabbi Akiva began like a child to study olive base. And slowly he rose and grew and increased his knowledge and his awareness and his wisdom until he became the greatest teacher of the Jewish people. The whole Torah that we have comes from Rabbi Akiva. The entire oral tradition comes from Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva saw things that Moses did not see. He saw what a soul is. He saw a soul in a way that even Moshe, so to speak, did not understand. Rabbi Akiva saw the soul that is rooted in the koitzim, in the crowns on top of the letters. Rabbi Akiva saw the soul that's hidden in Torah in a more invisible way. It's not openly displayed in a letter which we understand and appreciate. Rabbi Akiva in the thorns found heaps upon heaps of law. And here we come to a lovely mystical revelation of the Megala Mukais. It's in source number 12. The Megala Mukais is a famous classic Kabbalistic work authored by Rabbi Nathan Shapiro, Rabbi Nosson Shapiro, the rabbi of Krakow, Poland. He passed away on the 13th of Av in the year Shin Tzadig Gimel, 1633 at the age of 48. And his work, Megala Amukais, is a classic in the world of Jewish mysticism and spirituality. And there he takes it a step further. He tells us, the verse tells us in Parshas Kisisa, God tells Moses, You want to see me? You can see my back. You cannot see my face. Moses says, I want to see you. God says, my back, not my face. And the Talmud tells us in Brachas, Davzai in Brachas, page 7, God showed him the Kesher Shel Tfilin. God showed him his back. He showed him the knot on the Tfilin of the head. And if you'll go to the last page of your curriculum, we have a picture of the Tfilin. You see there's the Tefillin Shal Rosh and the Tefillin Shal Yad. It's the last page of your curriculum. On the right you have the Tefillin on the head. There's a knot at the edge. It looks like a dalit. That knot is placed on the nape, on the back of the head, when a person puts on the Tefillin of the head. God showed him that knot, the dalit. According to Yonis and ben Uziel, a commentator on the Bible, God showed him the Yud in the Tefillin Shal Yad. The tefillin on our arm has a yud. And you see it in the picture as well on the last page of the curriculum. and has a yud. So either God showed him the dalad on the nape or the yud on the tefillin which goes in our hand that shows on our arm. Comes the Megala Mukas and says, So Moshe Rabbeinu saw either the dalad or the yud. Two letters of God's name, Shaddai. Shin, dalad, yud, shakai. There's the shin, there's the dalad and the yud. Moshe saw the back, either the dalad or the yud. And then there's Rabbi Akiva. It says in the Pasuk, in the year of the verse, in the year of which I just read in verse 10, V'chol yikara se'enoi. His eye observed all of the glory, all of the yikar. The Medrash says this goes on Rabbi Akiva. The book of Esther tells us that the Jews experience light, gladness, joy, and honor, dignity. So the Gemara tells us in Megillah, Dafta Zion, page 16, Yikar elu tfilin. Dignity is tefillin. So when we say, V'chol yikar ra sa'ino, Rabbi Akiva saw all of the yikar. V'chol yikar, he saw all of the tefillin. Moshe Rabbeinu only saw the dalit and the yud of the tefillin. Rabbi Akiva saw also the shin of the tefillin. Moshe Rabbeinu saw only the back. Rabbi Akiva saw also the face. Where is the shin? If you look in the picture, you'll see that the shin is on the face of the tefillin. If when somebody is putting on tefillin, when you're wearing tefillin on your head, the shin shows up above your face. Everybody can see the shin. On the two sides of the tefillin, there's a shin. The dalit is in the back. The yud is on the muscle of the tefillin shalyad. Rabbi Moshe Rabbeinu saw the back. 
Rabbi Akiva saw Yekar, V'chol Yekar Eilat Filin. He saw us of the Shin. This is what the Megal Amukas explains. What does this mean? It means that the levels which usually God says, Lo yero, you can't see this. Moshe Rabbeinu saw these levels. He saw the face of the tefillin, which usually can't be seen. This is similar to the crowns on top of the letters of the Torah. There are the letters of Torah which are accessible for everybody to read, to sing, to appreciate, to learn, to understand. And then you have the souls that are rooted in those letters. And then you have the level of the souls which are beyond revelation, which are beyond exposure. It's, they're rooted in the intimacy, in the face of God, which nobody sees. They're rooted in levels which nobody can experience, nobody can appreciate them. Not because they're not, not, not connected, because they're connected on a much deeper level. You have to go much, much deeper. You have to go to the crowns on top of the letters, what the Kabbalah calls Kaitzer Shal Yud. That crown on top of the Yud. Kesser, the level of Kesser, the level of the crown. What does it say in Tefillin? The Talmud tells us in Brachas, page 6. What does it say in God's Tefillin? In God's tefillin it says, Mi ka'amcha Yisrael ga'echad ba'aretz. Who's like your nation Israel? One nation on earth. That's what it says in God's tefillin. Moshe Rabbeinu sees the Dalit and the Yud of God's tefillin. Shin Dalit Yud. Rabbi Akiva saw the face. Rabbi Akiva saw the shin. Rabbi Akiva saw the crown above the letter. And that's why Rabbi Akiva expounded the Vav in the whole Torah. Every Vav. And he expounded every S. Vav and S are secondary words, secondary letters. They're prefixes. But Rabbi Akiva sees in them a whole Torah, a complete Torah. The Vav is extra. The Vav is the prefix. And the S is extra. These are the souls represented not by the 600,000. These are the additional souls. The Vav souls. The souls that come before the letters. But Rabbi Akiva sees in each of these souls laws and laws and laws. Tilei tilim shalalachas. This is the Vav. So you have in your sources, the Gemara tells us in Edarim, source 6, Mishis dvarim yata Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva became wealthy from six things. Talbun the Dharam, page 50. Six, six is Vav. Rabbi Akiva was especially connected to the Vav. In Torah Shabal the oral tradition, there are six sections. Zroyim, Mayid, Noshim, Nezik, and Kachim, Taras. So when Moses forgot about the 1775 souls, when Moshe doesn't know what happened to these extra souls, what happens? V'yes ha'elef. V'es ha'elef. V'es. The V'es is you have a Vav, which Rabbi Akiva knows how to expound a Vav, and you have an S, which Rabbi Akiva expounds an S. Could have said, V'elef u'shva me'es. V'es ha'elef. This is the Vav and the Yes, the souls that were extra, the souls that were forgotten, the souls that were alien, the souls that were estranged. They didn't fit into the 600,000 letters in the Torah. From them, he made Vavim, he made hooks for the pillars. He found the Vav. Rabbi Akiva finds the significance in the Vav, in the hook. What did Moses find? These souls are on the border. They're on the fence, they're on the boundary, they're on the pillars, which are on the outside of the sanctuary, like Rabbi Akiva was. Rabbi Akiva was such a soul. And he hated the person who will not let him maximize his potentials. And it all depends how you look at him. Rabbi Akiva taught Moshe how to look at a person, how to look at every soul to be able to see the vav on the pillar. This then becomes the great lesson of this moment. How you look at a child, how you look at yourself, how you look at another person. Sometimes we ourselves are on the boundary, on the border between sanity and insanity, between ethics and profanity, between holiness and the antithesis of holiness, between love and hatred, between faith and despair, between success and failure. We're on the, on the pillars, vavim la'amud, and yet it's our power like Rabbi Akiva to be able to see in each thorn in each kites, heaps upon heaps of halacha. This is Rabbi Akiva's legacy and message even to Moshe Rabbeinu.